103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Deadpool is another argument about what a hero actually is, right? Oh, give, That's it, to what... me. give it to me then. Uh, oh, what's what's the argument? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The point is that he shows very pos- positive um, virtues. He, he sticks up for people who really can't stick up for themselves in certain right. circumstances. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he he he's also really funny so it's just like oh he's enthusiastic and funny is that is that a good thing well you enjoy watching him do it right Mm -hmm. right maybe i should try to learn to be more enthusiastic and open and funny right (laughs) but deadpool also kills people yeah like he's like one time psychotic killer like does that balance itself out i wonder like there's the argument right there. yeah right Right. exactly to quote a line from uh schwarzenegger movies uh yeah, but they were bad. They were bad people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LP FM, live right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today is Sunday, August 25th, 2019. And if it's not where you're listening, then it's a rebroadcast of the show or a podcast. I'm Dr. Five, and as usual, we have Wombat on the phone with us. Hello, Wombat. It's the Wombat! I'm ready to go. Let's have a fun time today, guys. Yay! And Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a call-in talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we also talk about religion, religious faiths, God's holy books, and superstitions. Hmm. And if you get the... Excuse me. If you get the feeling that you're the only non-believer in Knoxville, well, you're just not. There are several atheist, free-thinking, rationalist groups that exist right here in Knoxville, and we'll be telling you how you can connect with them right after the mid-show break. Uh, Today's topic is, what, philosophy of Christianity or religion in general? And we have a guest with us today. Uh, Ty, would you like to introduce your your guest? Sure thing. Uh, So we're going to be talking about truth and uh, how people determine if things are true or not. But it could also stretch to things that are outside of religion. And I thought it was really cool to bring up someone who's really interested in trying to do this as a project. His name's Human Ape. And welcome to the show. Hey, Human Ape, what's up? Uh, good, good. I thought I was going to be Honest Ape. Hey, I Honest Ape. A... There you go. Honest Ape. Let's yeah. go. doesn't matter either way. But I'm well. Honest Ape, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and about the project that you're going through, too? Um, so, uh, well, I'm a teacher. So that's that's my interest. I'm naturally interested in how people can know things and how my students can know things. Uh, and so kind of in short, the idea is just to have conversations about that openly. And that's what I try to do. I'm, I'm going to try to do kind of like a um, street epistemology style or I want to start doing videos like that soon. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm working with people at some mentors at some of the schools that I work at have been helping me with these ideas and develop them. So, um, but the basic idea is just to have a conversation with people about what's true, kind of go with our kind of write down those intuitions that we all have, that we all tend to have, Mm -hmm. and then to start to talk about some of the beliefs and see if that really is matching up with kind of our intuitions of what we would say is true or not. So if I can understand this, like you'll have a conversation with someone out outside, like maybe at a park or something, and you will ask them, so like, what does it take? What's your criteria for determining if something's true? And then you guys will work together to write down that criteria or like have some sort of record of it. And then you'll talk about an actual belief that they believe is true and compare it to that criteria. Is that more or less? Yes. Like- yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the short of it. It's not, I haven't talked to anybody necessarily at a park yet. I have talked to people that I disagree with, um, politically and my students <laughs> okay. obviously are the two, two main crowds for me so far, but I am trying to expand that and to, to make it more inclusive and, and kind of global. Okay. Sure. So, so uh, friends and four year olds <laughs> <laughs> and students and students and students. And students. Yeah. No. Oh yeah. You're talking about the students. Yeah. Uh-huh. The, no, the, the students are of college age. Okay. So great, 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 great. I don't know if I mentioned that. No, yeah, like no. sometimes that's even worse as far as like maturity levels go, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You are right about that. Oh, yeah. Hey, let's write it down so, on the list. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing, let's get right into it. Uh, one of the first things that you mentioned was how it matches up with your intuitions. Yeah. Uh, our intuitions can be flavored very strongly by our earliest knowledge training. Mm. Uh, they could be dead wrong due to that. So how do you address th- that problem? 
Yeah, um, so you're right about that. Uh, th- that's the point of the conversation, right? So the point of the uh-huh. conversation is to list those intuitions, and if, if there's a reason for challenging that intuition, to go ahead and challenge it, Yeah. right? But what I found in doing this practice myself is that that's not actually that necessary, at least for me. In my conversations that I've, I've had, uh-huh. it usually actually is good enough to just talk about those intuitions. And what I find is we tend to agree when I'm talking with somebody. It's just yeah. like, well, how do you determine? And so, for instance, um, kind of the, the list that I made, but one of those things is, like, if we can observe it, we have a certain amount of confidence that we can say that it exists, right? Ooh, yeah. yeah. That that's how we. That's one way we can know what's true, possibly. Well, you can misinterpret the the, the senses, but I mean, yes, I would right. agree with you pretty much there. I would say it's right, more exactly. confidence so you, than not seeing it at all. Say um, that again. I would say it makes me more compelled than not seeing it at all. Completely. Exactly sure. right. Right. And the point is that a lot of people have that intuition. Like even even people that you might disagree with heavily in terms of religion or politics mm. are going to say that as one of the potential ways to figure out what's true. Well, I'm going to observe things. Now, again, there are, right. there are complications to that. Yeah. Obviously we, we talk about what those complications are, mm. uh, but you get this, this very natural kind of progression of a conversation where these, these things come up naturally. And these are also um, linked to the, the philosophers have already essentially had this conversation we have the empiricists, right? The empiricists in philosophy, they're going to come along and say, well, if we can observe it, we can be sure of it. But then there are philosophers who are like, hold on, that's not exactly right. Right. And they have their challenges to that proposition. Yeah, right. right? And, and, it's, and it's become yeah. this complex conversation about epistemology. But what's so great about it to me is that I have found that a lot of them are intuitive, and that's great for building common ground between people and, and creating a standard for us to be like, okay, now we have a standard. Let's see if we can hold ourselves to the standard or if we need to possibly revise the list. Does the list need to be changed instead of our beliefs or should we change our beliefs instead of the lists? You know, mm. and just have that type of conversation. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. I can see the idea behind it. Would you say then that you've had conversations that were always like key towards an, an agreement between the two of you as far as like what you find to be intuitively true? Or is there cases where it's like, hey, both of us are having problems with this. What should we do at this point? Um, so the biggest complication for me has been that we tend to agree about how to decide what's true in kind of the sense that we end up talking about. But um, when it comes to other things, people seem to want to build a separate list mm-hmm. for the beliefs that they want to keep. Mm-hmm. Right. That's interesting. And so that that is also something that you have to accommodate for. So, for instance, when we're talking about the list of how to decide, when I've talked uh, about the list with my friend who who is a uh, Christian, uh, he kind of just like, well, yes, I I agree that this is how we're going to determine what's true, but in terms of my faith, that's different, mm. right? Well, yeah. Why did they throw up that uh, that barrier though? If they're actually trying to get to the truth, can't. Can't they recognize that their faith, the faith, might be a barrier to getting to the truth? Right, right. Or yeah, I know. That and and I think standards. what I do at that point is I'm like, okay, well, what is that? What does that look like then? How did you get? How did you? If there's a separate list, let's look at that list too. Yeah. Right. And find right? out which one's more reliable, if anything. Right. Uh-huh. Say that again. Sorry. And find out which one of the two is more reliable for coming to like a true conclusion. Right. I Nothing should be exempt from examination. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. And that's also an intuition that we have too. I, I found that most people are open to discuss these things, which is which is really great. What do you do if there's something true that can't be reached intuitively? What do you What do you do if there's a truth that can't be reached intuitively? Yeah, like quantum quantum or science. even more simple stuff, Physics like stuff. hey, um, you know, uh, the more dense something is, the smaller it could be. So that seems weird. It's like intuitively, bigger things are heavier than smaller things. Or so yeah. why is it that when something can get smaller but be more dense, it weighs more. Like that's it's not as an intuitively understandable thing to understand. It's not it's like inverse relationships aren't necessarily intuitive. You have to like sit up for a couple of seconds and be like, Oh, okay, now I get it. But it's not an intuitively understood thing. Or, you know, like there's a lot of stuff that seem that 
It's a little bit more complicated, but it isn't necessarily intuitively true. And that can go on to multiple levels to even the thing that Doubter 5 was mentioning. So what do you do if you're having a conversation and you're trying to reach an intuitive truth, but it's just not there, but it's still true? Yeah, so I think those things that are <clears throat> counterintuitive are kind of subsumed in the practice of good induction, like properly done induction. So, what do you mean by induction? We have logic, we, logical training. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. It's 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 recognizing that. So so, you can't always observe something directly, right? That's the truth. The truth is that there's some things that we can't observe directly that we're still going to say are true. So, for instance, I can't really observe Abraham Lincoln live his life, right? Yeah. But I still do believe that Abraham Lincoln, there was a person named Abraham Lincoln who lived a life. And the reason that I think that isn't because... Um, and the reason that I think that isn't because I've observed Abraham Lincoln live his life. It's because I've uh, seen pictures of him in history books and I've read... Uh, news articles and and I've I've put nice. I've observed other things that I'm going to use as evidence to build the idea that Abraham Lincoln was a person that actually existed. Hmm. There's a trail of evidence, actually. Or really, it's a pretty mundane thing to believe that we had a president. We've had over 40 of them, and they've been stretched back over time. So to right. say that we've had a president named Bob, it's like sure, why not? Like true, you know, that's true too. Yeah, like. We can fight. We can figure that out. That's fairly mundane, and we can get a standard of evidence that meets that claim fairly readily, because it's a mundane claim, mundane amount of evidence to support. Right, and it doesn't cost you anything to believe it. Hmm. I will, I don't think that's a good reason to believe anything. But yeah, that is true. No, I mean it's uh, it's a good reason not to believe something if it's questionable in the first right. place. Hmm. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I, I would agree with that too. And I've I've been thinking of ways to even incorporate that idea into this into all of this is like cuz cuz it is true that the type of claim kind of dictates in some ways what you need in terms of evidence. Right. 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 Yeah. Sure. So that's I, also I something in yeah. mind. What was it uh Carl Sagan said, you know, Incredible uh, claims require incredible evidence. More or less, yeah. yeah. Extraordinary, yeah. yeah. Though I would extraordinary, say, that's the word. And I would say, like, if some, if you got someone from, like, a tribe in the Amazon who's never heard of a president before, that would seem extraordinary to them. But we should be able to have that evidence to substantiate that to the point where it's just so commonplace. It's like, oh, okay, so it's like a village leader, but for a bigger place. Okay, I get that. That's now mundane now. Like, it might be extraordinary right. at, at the beginning, but as long as you can support it with evidence then you have a good reason to believe it. And if we can't come up with good evidence for presidents existing then he's in his right to not be convinced that that's the case yeah. it's not his fault that he doesn't believe it it's our fault for not yeah. <laughs> doing our research and right. presenting to him in a in a uh in a good manner that w makes a compelling argument for why this obviously right. mundane thing actually exists or not and it's also uh, some people. Don't, it's not really important whether they existed or not. Their ideas stand by themselves, like um, That's interesting. Aristotle and uh, uh, Plato. You know, their their writings, uh, whether they existed or not, as they you know we believe that they existed hmm. as Aristotle. As long as the ideas are valid, we can just go with the ideas. Sure. No yeah. matter who wrote them. I would. I can say that goes beyond just historical figures to figures that we know now don't exist, but maybe in the future they might be turned into religions. But like you have like, you know, your your comic book heroes who like stand for justice, uh, responsibility. What's Spider Man's main thing? Like, uh, great power requires great responsibility or something like that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Like there uh -huh. are, there are like solid catchphrases that you like see in fictional characters that can still stand apart from. Uh, them as people and more be as ideals for how to interact with people and conduct yourself. I, well, look at uh, Confucius and Buddha. I mean, sure. they may or may not be real people, but their ideas stand. Yeah. 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 Um, and yeah, they I are think that's an important now. point, too. <laughs> we were talking to an atheist before, or not an atheist, an Episcopalian, who's now an atheist, by the way, <laughs> after a couple of yeah. conversations. Yeah, our last cool. guest. Uh, he's finally out of the closet. The oh, thing, very good. The thing for him was um, he, he, he loved gods. Like, he loved a lot of examples of gods, and he found a lot of value in, like, um, researching them. Though he didn't take them as a literal truth, he did see value in, like, what they stood for and and he believed in that 
And once he was able to parse the two of like, hey, I know this isn't real, but I do love them as a character. He's like, okay, well, if I don't believe it, I'm an atheist. But I still like these characters. I'm like, you, dude, uh-huh. I love a lot of God. Like yeah, a lot of uh-huh. as characters, there's plenty of them. Like I've just yeah, played look at Thor. <laughs> yeah, I love Thor. It does like funny yeah. Thor, Taiko Atiti's Thor, great. But I've also mm-hmm. played a game called Assassin's Creed that has like a bunch of like, um, right. you know, Peloponnesian gods, Greek gods, the uh, Roman pantheon, and you're like, whoa, these characters are so interesting, and the dynamics they have with each other are so great that I just picked up books and started reading about them, and I'm like following like the mythology of these you know deities and it's really enjoyable for me so like there's nothing wrong with loving a god in fact i would say there's more atheists that love the caricature of like atheists hate god <laughs> is it real is it right, yeah. but you will definitely find atheists that love a lot of different kind of gods <laughs> so it's actually kind of interesting it's yeah different. you could you could probably consider me that on an extreme end sure uh, i i think that the idea of i i love the idea of narratives and i actually think that they, they can be a great common, an, another great common ground for people. Mm. And I think that the way that uh, in, in terms of, so we've had this conversation about truth now, yeah. right? I think narratives help us have conversations about morality in some way. Mm. There might be some overlap there, but you know, when I go to a movie, I, I, I've said this uh, to you before. Um, when, when I go to a movie, I feel like I'm, I'm being somebody's arguing with me like the the person who made that movie is arguing with me about what it means to be the protagonist and what it means to be the antagonist and what are the qualities i see in the protagonist that i'm really going to agree with the director oh yeah that is what makes a good human and i i want to emulate that a little bit more now Hmm. um and and this is this is you know like harry potter what makes harry potter a protagonist well, sure. he's close to his friends. He's he's willing to sacrifice himself in certain circumstances. Uh, he's generally kind to people. He sticks up for the underdog. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's what makes him Harry Potter. That's what makes him a good human and the protagonist. And what is who's the antagonist? The antagonist is literally the opposite of that. Spoilers. In the film. Spoiler alert, guys. All right, going. Oh, on. oh, oh do we have to do that? I'm sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> if you haven't seen Harry Potter, I feel sorry for you. You should, you should do it. It's it's a great narrative but sorry uh that's that's where i'll end that conversation okay okay <laughs> no just playing with you i was just playing sorry for interjecting but yeah i agree i do think like it's sort of like a um, uh, a debate between uh, uh a battle of different ideologies and you might find yourself inspired to root for one of the characters just based on how they are conducting themselves because you see value in that if that was like adopted by the general public to act in that particular way like but I also like anti-hero movies too. Like I, I mean, I like my Deadpool's. I like my uh, Transport. Oh yeah, yeah. There's... But those are also to me arguments too. Deadpool is another argument about what a hero actually is, right? Oh, give That's it to what... me. Give it to me then. Uh oh, what's what's the argument? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So the the uh, the argument is, can you still have so so Deadpool? What what are his virtues? Right. He has the the idea of an antihero is they have these quote unquote virtues uh-huh. versus these other things that were like we don't know how we feel about that. Okay. So he still cares about the uh, well. See, now I'm gonna start spo- I, that I don't uh-huh. want to spoil. So the point is that he shows very pos- positive um virtues he he sticks up for people who really can't stick up for themselves in certain right. circumstances. Sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, he he he's also really funny so it's just like oh he's enthusiastic and funny is that is that a good thing well you enjoy watching him do it right Mm -hmm. right maybe i should try to learn to be more enthusiastic and open and funny right Mm -hmm. but deadpool also kills people yeah like he's like one ton psychotic killer like it does that balance itself out i wonder like there's the argument right there yeah right Right. exactly to quote a a line from uh schwarzenegger movies uh yeah, but they were bad. They were bad people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like, is what what balances? Like, sure, he's definitely agreeable. He's definitely funny. He, he seems like a cool guy to hang out with, but he's also psychotic, like to like yeah. a fundamental core. So it's just like, where are is does one counteract the other? As far as like, here's a here's an example of a person. Like, are is the argument like psychopaths can be funny people too? No, I think the question is, is it, is, I think what you're being asked to do is, is Deadpool's action uh-huh. in a certain scene the right decision, even though it's murdering? So, for instance, when he murders the whole Yakuza, which is the beginning of the film, so sure. I don't feel like it's that big of a spoiler. Now go for it. Um, 
the question becomes, if you actually had the ability to stop the Yakuza, would it be the right thing to do? Hmm. Now, he enjoys it, right? So that might be another level. Like, is it okay to enjoy it yeah. even? You know? Yeah. Right, that's another question, but that is still something that you can kind of grapple with as the audience and think sure. about, and and really assess critically, uh, and 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 think about your own morality and how it stands to that, and if there's things to consider. Is there a time to kill? Hmm. You know, is there a time to do that? Is it well, right? Every nation on earth would say yes to that, hmm, uh, true. because they have standing armies and you know, which are prepared to kill if necessary. I will. Right. I will. But on an individual a vigilante level. <laughs> Sure. No, I'd say every nation would agree that no, it's not at that level. I would yeah. say the same mechanics that made characters that are intriguing and worthwhile to talk about like over multiple generations like Deadpool or Superman or Spider-Man is the same mechanisms that we probably use to come up with a lot of the god claims that we had way back in the past. And as we present like these characters like Odin, for example, who's like, yeah, he's powerful, but he's very conniving and will backstab you, despite the fact that he's like one of the most powerful and should be most altruistic gods in existence, or Loki, or, uh, uh, I mean, there's characters in the Bible that do the same thing, too, and Absolutely. they inspire conversation. I'd say as atheists, they we, uh, we have the ability to say like, hey, we love these characters, we love talking about these characters, we're really intrigued by them, but that could be a separate conversation from whether or not they're actually true or not. And, Absolutely. and if we can separate once we separate those two it's like now we have this whole worth wild world of mythology that we can like dissect and 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 connect with together without having the weight of taking it literally you know uh, sure. and i think there's value in that so would you say that's kind of close to what you were trying to do with with your outgoing or what i was mischaracterizing that no that's i think that's exactly it Okay. That is uh, nail on, or that's hammer on nail head. Yeah, that's. <laughs> so, what are the things? Some of the things that you uh, you discover or, or uh, discuss in your classes. Your, can you go to some examples? Yeah. Uh, well, and in, in the classes and the conversations I have with conservatives are going to be different. Okay. So, the conversations that I usually have. So, I, I'm more willing to talk about spiritual things with a conservative, or or those you know those narratives, right? Um, uh, with my class, I'm more interested in making sure that they understand academic epistemology. And so when we talk about building, we, we, we focus much more on that, that conversation of truth because I feel like morality uh, in terms of philosophy gets a lot more mucky. Sure. And, and, I, and I trust them to deal with it. We have some basic conversation, but really what I like to do is, okay, we've made this list of how to determine what's true. Now let's look, let's go look at sources. So we'll look at opinion sources, we'll look at news sources, and we'll look at academic sources. And we'll say, are they doing things that we would expect given this conversation about truth? Are mm. they doing those things that we said were the proper ways to build truth? And what they yeah. tend to find is that the opinion sources don't really do it nearly as well as the academic or the scientific uh, how how scientific scientific or academic discourse happens. The method of science do science walk, per se. Do they walk away from that conversation thinking opinions are less valuable than like the news or academic sources? And do you inspire them to? Do you in any way find or explain some value in the, the opinion? Yeah. So what we talk about. So, so so first of all, it's kind of on it's uh it determine it's based on who the opinion piece is from right so that's the thing is you're analyzing those opinion sources individually so you might actually come away feeling like oh well i actually that opinion source did really well about being careful with their claims and qualifying when we said they should qualify mm. qualifying being like just limiting your claims so okay. i'm not going to say all i'm going to say most right right oh they use most correctly right um this is just a general idea that they get Generally, they become more skeptical of opinion pieces and more they become more confident in academic works, which is right. great by the time yeah. they go to the research project. Because I'm like, now you actually understand why we tell you, you, to, you to use academic sources. Hmm. Right? That's why this is our procedure. standard. Uh -huh. it's like we didn't higher, just make it up. It's not something we're trying to brainwash you with. No, it's like a higher quality of um, thoroughly investigated data compared to what something could just be said or yeah. misinterpreted exactly. or mischaracterized. That's a more religion. reliable method of getting to the truth. There you go. Right. Yeah. right. And they're talking to each other, too. So sometimes they'll have an opinion piece 
Uh, and it, it, it's also the case a lot of times where usually if the opinion piece is really good at what it's doing, at, at making claims and stuff, it usually tends to agree with the academic interpretations or represent those in some way, even though there are still complications there, which we right. talk about. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Because you never know what what they're leaving out of an opinion piece. They could uh, they can include all the stuff that agrees with them, mm. which actually exists, but they could leave out a lot of things that doesn't. I like For sure. The, I like the idea that it's not necessarily is this thing an opinion or a news article or an academic piece that determines whether or not it's reliable. It's the standard that they're using that determines if it's reliable. And if you actually right. have, uh, oh, we're getting closer to the bottom of the hour, but uh, hey, uh, <laughs> let's talk about this when we get back from the break. How about that? Uh, this is 103.9 okay. FM Radio. We're coming to you from the Birdhouse. This is Digital Free Thought Radio Hour, and we're going to be back right after the break. See you guys. Okay. Sounds good. You're listening to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on Wozo 103.9 LPFM in Knoxville, Tennessee. Feel free to join in on the conversation at 865 333 5937. That's 865 333 Five nine three seven, and now back to the show. Three, digital two, free radio one. Hour. Simply the best. Welcome back. This is Digital Free Thought Radio Hour right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, WOZO Radio one hundred three point nine LP uh, FM here in Tennessee. Um, I'm Dr. Five. With us we have uh, the Wombat. Say hello, Wombat. I'm the Wombat. And we have Honest Ape. Say hello, Adam State. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, He's it's so going honest. well. And uh, let's talk about just for a second the free thought groups that are here in Knoxville, Tennessee, that you might be able to join. You should be able to join. If you don't have one where you live, start one. Yeah. Anyway, it's the easy. first one is the well, they're all uh, right here. Uh, they got about four groups. The Atheist Society of Knoxville uh, has 950 members. It's available on Meetup. You can go to Meetup or you can go to knoxvilleatheist.org. There's also the Rationalists of East Tennessee. They're found at rationalist.org. The Sunday Assembly is a church that started uh, for no God. Uh, people, people who no longer believe in God, they can go to the church anyway and still have the fellowship of a church type gathering just do a google search for a sunday assembly in your area and uh there's also a secular student alliance that are in most high schools and colleges now if you don't have one in your school start one it's a free thought movement for those who like to find other free thinkers to hang with everybody needs like-minded friends and atheists are no difference now there's also an atheist tv call-in show here in knoxville besides the radio show it's a tv show called free thought forum it comes out at 6 30 on wednesdays on comcast channel 12 charter channel 192 you can also watch some of their archives on youtube by searching for free thought forum knoxville knock yourself out it's good stuff Anyway, back to our show. <laughs> you say knocks yourself out? I love that. That's good. That's it. That's cool. No, That's I good. didn't say that, but no. I like it. Yeah, we need to coin that. That's better. I like that. Yeah, it's like yeah, a yeah. Farley's Tap Room Pizzeria knocks yourself out. I love that. Yeah, That's good. Really? All right. We're freaking stuff out. All right. Anyway, Honest Ape. Uh, so uh, you're our guest for the show, and we're talking about the project that you have where you're trying to build um, connections with people uh, and have conversations about the nature of truth and how we determine if things are true. And I think you said you do it in like a three-part step. Uh, you, you set up a criteria with them, then you ask them about their beliefs, and then you, you see if they are using that criteria to uh, support that belief that they have. Um, do you mind talking to you talk, talking to us about some of your success co successful conversations? Success stories, breakthroughs, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so well, first, um, I'm going to modify that three-part process just a little bit. You're going to add five more parts? Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> now go for it. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> so, um, so basically, we do have that conversation. Hmm. We examine their beliefs. Um, and, or, and, and we, by, by the way, we don't have to do it to them. If they, if they want to kind of reverse that, if they want to ask me how I decide what's true, and 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 compare that to one of my beliefs, sure. I also think that's appropriate, uh, or that's a good conversation to have, even. Cool. Um, and then from there, what I would like to do. Um, which I haven't necessarily fulfilled this part yet, but this is kind of the third step for me, which it's the is prize fighting. To, I'm sorry. It's the fisticuffs. Like you just throw <laughs> the table across and you start punching each other and 
see whose ideas last till the yeah. end. It's a battle royale of <laughs> yeah. blood and blood yeah. sport. Um, but I, I, what I would hope that they would do is that they would kind of print out that list or pull it up at some point when they're actually confronted with the claim and say, okay, h- how should I go about uh, assessing this claim step by step in the way that I said I should do it? So it's their personal list to keep after the end of the conversation? Yes. Yes, it is. Well, that's cool. Um, and, and the reason that I, I'm doing this is because one thing that I found as somebody who used to be a fundamentalist Christian who, to me, the most important parts is I, I just didn't trust science or academia. I, I believed a lot of things that were contrary to the data or the scientific consensus or the academic consensus. Um, and the reason that I and, and but I still had all the same intuitions that I have now about truth. The only difference to me in my head from my experience is that I didn't really have it in front of me in any moment to like really think about it critically. So, for instance, at my old church, there was this claim going around uh, that people generally believed, which was that people in Africa were being raised from the dead. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. And in that moment of being in that church, I, I kind of just accepted it. Right. Random question. Isn't that like. And how was that news taken? Wasn't was that taken with any degree of excitement of like, oh, maybe oh, these guys have figured excitement. out some stuff. That's awesome. Great. Maybe we should start learning voodoo. Uh, or, or was it like, yeah. So you mean in the church? Well, right. I, I want because I'm not I wasn't privy to what was discussed in the church, but I would imagine a a environment where people are looking forward to living in an afterlife. That wouldn't be a surprise to them. Or maybe I've just not been in church for so long that that would still be an alien concept. So, so the idea what's going on uh, well so the idea the the uh, africa part is actually only significant because there were christian missionaries over there that helped raise people from the dead oh uh, okay there's the yes so they were news. using it as like confirmation that yeah. their this ideas were genuine so it's white people bringing is... up the brown people that okay all right we got it we're locked in. yeah 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 basically. But the news is being imparted by the christian by the uh, preacher from the pulpit is that correct uh yes i i mean it's been a while since then i know that it was a rumor i think that the pastor did this is something that they themselves endorsed and said was happening wow Mm, wow and so and the thing is again if you had stopped me in that moment as a teenager and just said hey let's let's write down a list of how you decide what's true it would have it would have invalidated me really accepting that claim i couldn't observe it I can't repeat. I can't repeatedly observe it. You need that independent verification, Reproducibility. right? Reproducibility. That's, that's, I'm sorry. Reproducibility. Right. Exactly. And and so I did. I just didn't have the thing in front of me to really hold myself to a standard. Right. Even though if you would have asked me, I'm sure I would have still said yes. I think observing things is a great way to um, know that something is real. Yes, I know I can observe things that aren't real, and I need a way to distinguish that. And independent verification is a really good way. And yes, I know that in this circumstance, this claim can't be independently verified. Therefore, I really shouldn't accept it. Right? Right. It, yeah. It would have been an intuitive but conversation. I, the, the preacher himself, though, this gives me trouble because he's, he's theoretically passing on what the missionaries themselves have seen. And, right. And, you know, when you're sitting in the pew and you have missionaries in the field and you repay, you wait for the reports to come back and the reports come back to the preacher and the preacher is imparting that information to the, to the group, that's got to be incredible news when they hear that. Uh, how did they react? Uh, oh, uh, you mean my church? They loved it. <laughs> They, I mean, they should have been on their feet. Yeah. They should have, yeah. You know, what words did they use? How did how did they do that? We, I want to bring back we, my mother, you know, type of thing. Yeah. Basically. We talked about that event for for weeks, for weeks at that point. That was that like that's what it is. Is like something will happen in the church, it'll be news, and then we're talking about it for weeks. It's like our gossip. And it fades group. out. How could that possibly fade out? <laughs> yep. Yeah, it does. You, it does. Linda got a just, new car. Well, that's the new thing to talk about this day. It's like ooh. Yeah. It's, a it's actually interesting. You should say that because when that happened i remember being really excited for like a week or two yeah and then i remember youtubing like can i can i see videos of this and not really finding videos and then uh, just kind of moving on wow that's that awesome. was the process that's a low standard of evidence yes yeah. and that's where and that and that is the way it usually runs in some circles so jeez yeah like you but it, but it became easier once i had that standard once i yes. really sat down and thought about okay right. how do i decide and here it is in front of me 
Good. I have to be fair. This okay. is how I said I'm going to do it. So would you be interested in trying out that method right now, like over the over the radio with us? Like, absolutely. Can we try that? You out? mean, yeah, sure. So like, um, how does it start? How do you normally begin? So are you? Uh, do you want to approach this from you asking me how I do it, or me asking you? Try how with you Doubter do Five. It? I've talked. I talk so much. <laughs> Doubter Five. Do you have like, uh, like a, uh, hopefully a mundane belief or something that you're, you're, me? yeah, 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 that you. Wait, are you talking about Honest Ape right now, or uh, so I'm Honest sorry, Ape? I, I would love to see. I'd, I'd love to see you try this method with Doubter Five, who is Larry, who's yeah. Oh well, I've got a belief the souls aren't real. Should oh, there you that? go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a classic for the show. Sorry, it's an yeah. inside joke for us. But yeah, uh, that's his belief. So how would you go about that? Okay, so first we want to have that conversation. How do you decide what's true? Yeah. Right? How do you decide that uh-huh. you're going to accept a claim? That's really, uh, I, I think by the by the time we get to this end, uh, the end of this conversation, that's going to be a rejection of a claim, right? Well, uh-huh. his belief is that they don't exist. That's the belief. Right, and and I'm still not uh, up on the particular. So, for instance, I might. Inc- uh, okay, so let's just let's just see how it goes. All right, you're in the driver's uh, seat now. Right, right. So how do you, how do you de- how do you go about deciding what's true that you're going to accept a claim or not accept a claim? What's the process look like? Well, it's all evidence, uh, you know, and the val- validity of the evidence. And in two thousand years, or as long as religions have been claiming that souls exist and go to heaven, which goes back even to the uh, ancient Egyptians, uh, nobody has ever put forward any kind of solid evidence that uh, that they're real. Uh, right. But they assume that every other living thing on the planet has no soul, and uh, but we we live forever. I mean, I, it's kind of a egocentric claim that you know I can't possibly die. You know, I've got to have some kind of life after this one, and it just seems uh, arrogant and uh, egocentric right. to do that. Right. So this, uh, and it also might not necessarily work the same with all the people, but with all people. So I, I am, this is a bit of a deviation, but I do have a question. Uh-huh. Uh, and I'm just interested in what you would say, which is, uh, would you say that both of these statements are true? That you believe that there are no souls or that you lack a belief that there are souls? I'd say both of them. Both of them. Yeah. Okay. All right. I active. I actively believe that there are no souls. Okay. At, All right. at the same time, I don't believe them. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to this idea of evidence, right? Sure. Now, so what constitutes evidence? How do you decide that something is evidence or not? Um, well, if I can examine it, if it's something that, uh, besides anything better than anecdotal evidence, uh, would be helpful, um, uh, you know, we've watched seven seasons of Ghostbusters, or Ghost uh, Hunters on TV, and theoretically, a soul is a ghost and vice versa, and they have never produced one. Uh, they, they might we, say a soul is different from a ghost, but I'm not particular yeah, on yeah. the... When we talk about ghosts, everybody has different attributes for them. You know, like yeah. uh, when they see a ghost, the ghosts are generally clothed, you know, do we have... <laughs> Uh, ghost clothing. Yeah, you know, yeah. They, they're standing on a floor. Or do they? Do ghosts yeah. have weight? Do they? And why would they yeah. stop at the floor? Shouldn't they just go right on through the surface of the earth? Yeah, there's, there's a really funny um, comedian that's kind of like you know why are there why are there no like twentieth twenty first century ghosts you know uh-huh. that like wake you up in the middle of the night and ask what your Wi Fi password is? Oh yeah, or something. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's just it's just to me it seems silly. Uh, there, like I said, I, nobody's ever given me any any uh, evidence other than anecdotal. Hmm. Uh, and are you familiar with David Hume? Yes. Okay. He he has three principles that that uh, say that none of this is valid. The first principle is that people lie, or they are mistaken, or they're they're fooled all the time. This happens. We all know it. Yeah. The second principle is. The second rule is that for a miracle claim to be true, the laws of nature, which are immutable, would have to be broken. And the third rule is because of the first and second rules, no miracle claim or supernatural claim for that matter should ever be credited. If you did credit it, then you would have to give more credit to the rules of the universe being broken than that somebody might be mistaken, fooled, or lying. 
And that, for me, does it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so there's this chasm for me um, in terms of where you're at and what you know um, about epistemology already. Uh Um, This, I would probably get into an air. I would, we would probably, we could build my list probably pretty easily. You're going to accept that you can observe certain things, but it should be independently verifiable, right? You should be able to look at it or qualified people should be able to look at it, right? Right. You're going to agree that we can also use induction. We don't necessarily have to observe it directly, but we need to be able to observe some evidence that confirms the thing, right? I would agree. Uh, But that's also problematic because in terms of induction, any new piece of information might validate what you knew before, so you're going to accept it tentatively. You really need to get as much of the data as possible, which kind of requires you to have some type of peer review process where a bunch of other people who are also looking at different data than you are checking what you're observing as well, right? Okay, sure. So so we're going to agree probably along a lot of this, and, and we usually get there, but it would just be a lot quicker for you and me. But where you and I, I think, would be at would be the idea of uh, falsification by Karl Popper, uh, which is the idea that we don't, uh, and I'm, and again, I'm still a layman philosopher, so if I mess this up too bad, I do. I, I'm I'm looking for those types of critiques, but um, that we we don't tend to prove things true so much as we fail to prove them false. Yeah, and a lot of it comes down to the ability of falsification. If the premise itself is unfalsifiable, then where do you go? Now you have right. to make a decision whether you want to believe it on uh, anecdotal evidence or or not. So, th- so then my question would be: How is the claim um, that souls are not real falsifiable? Um, I don't see that. It how is. would you go about proving that claim false? You would go about proving that claim false by producing a soul. Hmm. No, no, I'm sorry. The, the the claim that souls aren't real, not are real. That would be you would be right if you, if no, you wanted. No, or, oh, I'm sorry. Saying. Hold on. No, no, no. You would you would prove it false by producing a soul. Yeah. A soul. Or good, reliable evidence for one. Which, I, since we don't have any attributes that we we don't we've never had a soul to examine, so how do we know what attributes or evidence would be valid for it? Yeah. Yeah. I, and I will. Um, I'll throw this out real quick. Sorry for interjecting. Um, and I actually like this method a lot. I really do think it's great. Though the distinction here is he's not saying I know they don't exist. He's saying I believe and I actively believe that they don't. And is that belief justified based on this, yeah. what he's presenting? And for what I'm seeing so far, it seems like, yeah, he's coming up with a really good argument to show that there's no case to even start believing in one. So it can't even be a candidate for consideration until someone brings some meaningful evidence to show that right. this is a possible thing to start believing in. And then we can work on whether or not we know or whatever stuff like that. But he's not compelled to believe it's true. And he actively believes that it's not true. And that, I mean, both of those things are the things that he can demonstrate. So right. like, and, well, it's belief, and I'm, I'm not claiming knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like it, that. Careful listening is really important in like these kinds of conversations. So, um, what you're saying um, might be, I, I, we might be in agreement here. I don't know if there's going to be some way to semantically split the difference. That's something I might have to think a little bit more about. Um, but just on the face of it. I, I would say that given the conversation that we've just had, that you seem to be lining up with pretty accurately those intuitions. So uh, that would be how the conversation would go. Um, I, I need to think about the kind of the nature of falsifiability a little bit more. Sure, I had uh-huh. it differently in my head, but okay. again, just given the way the conversation's gone, that I would just say, yeah, I mean, that's, that's about where we're we're at, and I would agree with that. And I can tell you, okay. an SC cool. agreeing with the person that you're talking to is like totally a normal part of it because you're not there trying to catch them in a trap and flip the tables on them. You're there just trying to learn something, and if it's true, you're gonna you're gonna absorb it and put it in your pocket. And I yeah. think like what Larry's presenting is like a really cool card to put in your pocket as far as like thinking about how to think, consider if things actually exist or not, and whether or not you should believe them. Right. Right. Yeah, no, I, I would I would agree with that. Um, I'm trying to think of the nature of falsifiability now, hmm. which is so one thing that I like to do, which is a good practice that I encourage my students to do okay. as well, 
which is to, I, I think analogies are a very great underused resource. And so what I want to do, or what I usually do in this circumstance is I think, would I accept this claim in its form, but about something else? Okay. That is analogous yeah. to Sounds it. Good. So for instance, if we were going to make the claim about fairies, would I get to that same conclusion by saying, I don't believe in fairies, right? And why don't I believe in fairies? Well, because there's not sufficient evidence, right? Or I'm sorry, I believe that there are no fairies is actually how, right. is actually the, the difference here, right? Yeah. I believe there are no fairies, right? Yeah. It's just like, so, so how do you go about, um, falsifying the claim there are no fa- uh, fairies I, well you would produce I, a fairy right yeah or, or that's evident, how you, credible that's how evidence. you would falsify it so okay it is yeah. falsifiable right mm-hmm. um but false i don't know if falsifiability is just like the first step okay so it's falsifiable it doesn't mean that it's true does all the evidence point towards it but just and that's where i would i might start to ask well what evidence do you have that points towards that what actual evidence so honestly well, just uh, interject here but we are the, we're talking about the can you hear me belief and no can you I hear me at all i don't think you can hear me yeah go, go ahead one but okay I, I don't know if you can hear me or not but um i just interject the claim that i actively don't believe that there's no fairies and i know that there are no fairies or there are no fairies are different right. claims um, right. And there's a subtlety there that's significant enough to warrant explanation. Saying I am not convinced that something's the case, I believe it's not the case, versus I know for a fact or I can demonstrate that it's not the case, requires a different standard of evidence to support it. One can be right. reached through just reasonable thinking and and just saying, hey, I'm actually just convinced that based on these principles that I've read and i've i found that this is a good reliable way to come to conclusions on what i should be convinced are true or not but saying hey there are no fairies that's something that you can demonstrate to be the case you're claiming knowledge at that point so it requires a test it's like well show me that there are no fairies and if you can't do that then maybe that knowledge claim isn't justified so i think what uh larry's explicitly doing is showing that like how you listen to the person and what you hear from them will dictate how what kind of questions and conversational approaches You'll try after the fact. But what's really important is just make sure you're listening to the person that you're talking to. That way it doesn't get misconstrued into a more uh, right. powerful claim than what's For sure. And, and it might also come down to what I was saying before, but semantics. It, it might also come down to semantical differences. Like, well, on one, under what conditions do you think it's ac- acceptable to use the word belief? Sure. And it's always worthwhile to just ask the person, what do you mean by that? Right. right. And right. SE, that's a very common thing. So I would just say like, hey, what do you mean? What do you mean when you say faith? Yeah, it's right. Big. That's huge. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's you... also uh, a really good practice. It's called Rogerian argumentation. Which, You're going to have to explain can... it. We have a we have an audience that loves having big words explained, please. Right. Right. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it's a practice that I, I have or it's an activity that I utilize in my own classrooms. Uh-huh. But it is just the practice of listening to somebody's argument and then what the the next step that you do is you reiterate that argument back to them in your own words and you have them confirm that that is their actual argument oh that's three points of contact yeah yeah, yeah. right right so that's what we call rogerian argumentation but yeah that is the that is also a very useful practice in yeah these circumstances it's actually a safety standard at my job so it's like hey i'm going to i'm going to leave this hammer on the floor and, and someone's like, okay, I understand you're leaving the hammer here on the floor. And then they hmm. say, Roger. That way, there's not a random hammer on the floor and someone trips over it or something like that. Like, right. stuff like that will, like a three-point conversation of just like, hey, I dropped the hammer on the floor. Yeah, I got you. No, no, no. Make sure you understand what I said because I don't want you to have, a, like, a safety issue. It's here temporarily. Let's make sure we three-point contact it. So, yeah, like, right, that's cool. that's very typical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that's you know, it's a kind of a safety measure in conversation. Yeah. Am I making sure that I'm actually dealing with your argument as opposed to what my head is your argument? Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What you construe as their co- argument. I right. always say like right. conversation is always a compromise between what you mean and the choices and the word wow. choice that you use to express that meaning, and how that person interprets your word choice to try to translate what you had meant. So it's yeah. always like this two middleman situation, even though it feels like, hey, language, I'm just throwing these words out. It's how that person's interpreting it 
that dictates how well you guys can actually communicate. So if it's worthwhile to like throw out terms that you were really familiar with, like if, for example, if someone says, hey man, um, I'm not an atheist, but I don't believe in any God claims. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm willing to work with that. Because <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> while all, all I, inter- I, I can interpret that as like, you're just, you don't want to be called atheist, I get it. But functionally in my head, it's it 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 checks a box in my head of like okay well we are at least are on the same page as far as what we believe to be true or no or require evidence more evidence to believe but it's just an issue of the word and i'm fine with that because i get the meaning and we can probably talk about that later but i'm not going to force my vocabulary on you like right and if they but if they phrase it as what would you label me as you'd be like well i would label you as an atheist yeah right right just in my opinion yeah right now, I know there are people out there that do this, but it, they kind of get my goat uh, in one particular way. Go for it. When they, if they don't believe in God and they, they say, but I'm not an atheist. Well, it's one, it's disingenuous. Mm. But two is it's, it's like they're standing off to the side pointing at atheists saying, I'm not one of them. Mm-hmm. And that to me is uh, troubling, uh, to yeah. say the least. Especially but, when it's done by like yeah. really, really smart people who really do care about the truth like uh-huh. it's yeah. like yeah you're right. on our side here like there's clearly a side that's against you know <laughs> like it's indoctrinating children is inhibiting progress of science is reducing limits to rights for women and color right. people and has a terrible history of pitting people against each other for their own profit and and, uh-huh. and let's not even talk about the sexual abuses and the political uh, destructions and meanderings and, and lobbying and that and getting their fingers in yeah. places where they shouldn't belong in a place that should be a separate church and state institution. Yeah, we yeah. Need I think a lot of it is is their understanding of the word. A lot of times they you know if you talk to them about it, they say, oh, "I'm not actively working against I'm a religion. I'm not an anti theist. I'm not vocal. Right. I'm not mad." Right. Well. None of that really uh, comes into the question at all. It's whether or not you believe in God. Right. If you don't believe in God, you're an atheist. It's, then you should own up to that. You should accept that. It's literally one answer to one question. That's exactly. It. I had my yeah. mom. I had my mom tell me I was going to, over to the Kentucky Free Thought Convention, which will be September 21st, and I told my mom I won't be able to come see her on that weekend. She had asked if I can come over, and I said I'll be actually talking at the atheist convention. She's a Jehovah Witness, and uh, we have like I'm I'm glad that she's like open to like talking about like where i'll where i go to talk but uh she said well while i don't share your atheist belief i'm really glad that you like still told me like where you're at so like i'll know where you are and i and i'd only reply like atheists don't really have a belief to share <laughs> that's the, <laughs> that's kind of the point <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so i always find like it's always a misinterpretation of what atheism is why people find themselves so can i can i sorry can i uh, have you repeat something real quick yeah go for it so, so I think maybe, and I, I might have just misheard you, but it sounded like you said atheists don't really believe anything. No, no, that's not no, what I said. No. Atheists believe okay. a lot of things. In fact, I would say they believe in more things in common with religious people than not. Like I have more or less almost the exact same beliefs as a Christian, except for the yeah. God. So, like, or and no, no, I would I, say, so what was the what was, what was the thing that you said then? Atheism, Do you remember? Atheism doesn't have doesn't share beliefs. There's no belief to share in atheism. So you don't Unless, share the belief that, that there is no God. Yeah, right, like there is no God. that's not a claim yeah. that atheists have. Like the, the claim, right. the only claim that atheists purport is I don't believe in a God or I'm not a theist. And that's right. not really a belief. It's just more of like a, a it's a lack of a, of a belief. Yeah, like if anything, it's like right. well, this this is just the position that I have, but on this one question, but it's not a belief. Like if you want to ask me what movie I think is the best movie, I can tell you. I can tell you Black Panther was an 8 out of 10. <laughs> I, can right. tell, I can tell you, <laughs> right. hey, you know, uh, Thor is pretty awesome, I, and I've, I've talked about him multiple times on the show. But yeah, like... Uh, so this would be different from the soul conversation we just had, okay. right? Yeah. In that people who wanted to unify against not... or unify about not believing in souls mm-hmm. or lacking a belief in souls might not necessarily believe there are no souls... They might is that correct? Right. Like they might not necessarily believe there are no right. souls, but they definitely lack a belief that there are souls. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So we got five minutes left in the show. How about this? Um, why don't you tell me one of like the coolest things from your list, or maybe something and that if, you? And if you have anything you'd like to tout, like a website or or something like that, you could give it a shout. Yeah, as we get into like the home stretch. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So actually, yeah, that that's great. 
Um, so I, never, I didn't get to talk about, I think maybe I hit on the successes a little bit, so maybe that, that would be good enough. I do have those, but uh, maybe that's at a different time. But in terms of the list, one thing that I would say is really important in terms of conversation that I think helps, or I found has helped, is to have a conversation about, uh, I think I think I've already mentioned the word, but qualifiers, and that is things that limit your claims, or they 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 describe how spe- how confident you are Ooh, in the I claim. Love that. Right. So when we mm-hmm. if we're going to use yeah. the word most, right? Well, what do you mean? Is is most over fifty percent? Is it fifty percent exactly? And we have this. And again, I, the thing that's great is that we have the same intuitions about those words as well. Yeah. Usually. Um, and then so that way when they say when they make a claim about most you can say is that actually do you have a way to demonstrate that it's over 50 percent to say that it's most or mm-hmm. should we scale that back a little bit okay i like that That's and, cool. and i know that you guys are already doing similar things in terms of street epistemology so there's that <clears throat> yeah so i can tell you right now street epistemology is not one thing and there's in my yeah. opinion there are a lot of people who are like this is not street epistemology. Like, don't listen to them because it's all about talking to people without being a jerk. So if you can fold <laughs> uh-huh. in what you're doing into SE and inform people of like how to do SE better with this method that you're doing or run into like hurdles and be like, hey, actually, don't do these things. They don't work as well. That right. makes this whole system of talking to people about anything better. Yes. So I would say, hey, let's not look at it as like two separate things. Just see like in this field of talking to people that we're all a part of, whether we're atheists or religious or whatever, we found these really good ways of having these conversations about sensitive topics. And this can yeah. be folded into like this whole new strategy. My end goal game would be literally to have like this kind of dynamic talk of like talking to people about the things they really strongly believe to be like taught in high school is like a subsection of communication yeah. class. Like yeah. this right. would be like the, the critical perfect thinking. Exactly. How well, this is my, that's thinking. my plan, by the way. Partnered critical thinking. Yeah, you're already in the system. <laughs> right. You're, like, so, you're in the so school. So there's a program in, in, in schools now. Maybe you guys will think this is great. Mm. Um, so colleges have for a long time been concerned about the public education system. Okay, good. And, and what's going on there. And so one of the program, and I don't even, I don't even think this was intentional. It, might, it, it actually wasn't intentional. It was built to, the, the program was made to save money, of course, right? which is the foundation of almost all of our ideas when we're doing something um, in America. But the uh, – hello? Hello? Hello. Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> but the idea is to um, – well, they teach college classes in high school now, right? Cool. Yeah. College, what AP, classes? AP, like AP courses, like calculus and stuff like that. No, oh, okay. no, no. Actually, direct. They teach those basic. You can get college credit. It's called in, in Ohio. It's called College Credit Plus. And high. Uh, so in a, in a typical a, a basic English or philosophy class, a professor will come to your school and teach you that class, and you can get credit for it, paid by the school, so that you don't have to pay towards tuition. Oh wow! Or you don't have to accumulate loans or something. Oh, cool. that's great. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. So and and more and more states are doing this. They have been for a while, but a lot of people who are interested in critical thinking have taken the has seen this as an opportunity to get some of those critical thinking conversations that are more typical in a college course dude i can make them more typical on a high school course which is what i'm doing i'm i'm eventually going to try to teach uh college argumentation in high school i want to become a high school ccp teacher that's my next step thank you for that i thank you i think we can make a whole show just about that but um we have a lot of things that we can talk about more i hope you come back on future shows and um and we can have some more time to discuss this Uh, all right Larry, do you ever want to close out the show? My my only closing out thing is I miss getting the atheist TV show thing confused because I had a whole thing about uh, Spider-Man oh, <laughs> being kicked out of the MCU thing. It was going to be great and hilarious. we got to find some way to work that in. But I do like next time. knocks you out. I love that. we got to work that in. I think that's better than Dillahunty's preach punch and stuff like that. I think we've yeah. got something going on here. We should work on okay. that. Okay. Okay, my my sign out as usual is everybody's going to somebody else's hell. Don't worry about it. Time to worry about it is when they prove that hells and heavens and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Bye. Live. See you next week. Bye. Thanks. See ya. See ya. Uh, hey, real quick plug from Honest Ape. Go for it. Yeah, you can find some of my work. I have a YouTube channel, Simple Arguments, in which I'm hoping to produce more videos that do what we're doing and then also i have a podcast called currency of discourse you can find that on youtube 
uh, with my co-host, and um, we're also on every platform. I or um, Apple. We're on a bunch of different ones. You can find us pretty much anywhere. Cool. Thank you for having me.